Please welcome to the great leaders, Jean-Philippe Bao, CEO of The Future is Neutral. Welcome. <laughs> and Pierre Olivier Brial from Manutan. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And uh, maybe we can start. I don't know if everybody went to your uh, booth. I think it was over here, right? This way, this, this direction. Way. Quite impressive. I encourage every one of you to go into this direction afterwards because I've learned a lot by uh, joining it. So maybe you can share with us what is exactly your vision and your purpose in The Future is Neutral because the, the, the name of your company is not uh, just, it's so iconic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, um, I'm very pleased to see uh, how many people are actually joining this kind of conversations because it's growing year after year. So it means that uh, there is a growing interest in those, uh, in those issues. Uh, very briefly, you know, uh, the future is neutral. Is, um, it's an enterprise, probably uh, the first enterprise in the automotive space because we work in the environment of the automotive industry. Uh, it's the first enterprise in the automotive space that is able to provide uh, a bit of solutions uh, in the field of circular economy for every step of the life cycle of a vehicle, from the conception of the vehicle to the fabrication, the production of the vehicle, the usage, and the end of life. How do we do that? In short, um, we partner with different entities. Uh, so we have companies operating which are already up and running which generated roughly 900 million euros worth of turnover last year, just to give you an order of magnitude of, of, uh, of the activity. So it's possible. So yes, it's possible, definitely. <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, through partnerships, uh, we need to combine the world of automotive and waste management to find the solutions that are necessary for the OEMs to meet their regulatory obligations, their competitiveness, and to move forward in the field of uh, uh, environmental concerns. Thank you. Very impressive, by the way. Um, so, Pierre Olivier, please uh, share with us also, because I, I believe that in Manuton you are moving from a traditional model to a more circular model. So, how do you combine both, and how do you make the shift happen? Because it's not so easy to combine both models. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So, yes, in Manuton we are a distributor. So, in fact, we are a billion euro company, and we are selling Basically, everything you see in this room, so we are selling uh, racking for warehouse, we are selling industrial supplies, we are selling chairs, we are selling office furniture. So as a distributor, our impact on the planet is a scope free. This is basically the product we are selling. Uh, it's much more important than our own electricity. So if we want to make uh, a transformation, we need progressively to sell refurbished products. So I will say, stop selling new products. It won't happen overnight. But progressively, start selling refurbished products. I come in an industry, and I will tell you something very crazy. Only 4% of the office furniture are put back on the market, refurbished. So 96% either are flown away or recycled. We think that 60% could be refurbished and put back on the market. And in Manutan, we are selling hundreds of thousands of products, and we believe that around 50 to 60% of what we sell could tomorrow uh, be refurbished, could become second-hand products. So we are really moving toward uh, this circularity model. And what is the size today, just to give us an intention, what is the size of the second-hand products in your activity? Well, it's, it's very new. Uh, basically, it's very new because we have started uh, just a few months ago okay. and we have opened a, a circular hub. So we are the first in the industry to now take the product, buy back the product, put them in the hub, refurbish the product and sell used product to our customers. And what is your ambition there? Well, the ambition first is to, is to learn because that's very new. And I think if I take the example of cars, Circular economy is like a concept car. Everybody loves it, everybody wants it, but when it comes to actually purchase uh, used furniture, then you encounter a lot of hurdles along the way. And we need to learn because the concept is very easy, but uh, then you have the question, okay, but I'm buying that, what are the warranty? 
Oh, I like these colors. Can you guarantee this color for 10 years? Well, in fact, no. Okay, I'd like to make a tender on the circular products. Can you show me the product? No, because we, you will sell you what we have. So in fact, you encounter a lot of new questions uh, on the supply chain. And we need to learn step by step. And we have opened this hub right now that is operational to learn with our customers and with our suppliers how we can uh, really reinvent the whole supply chain and then the whole economy of uh, today office furniture, tomorrow warehouse furniture, racking, shelving, and all those very sexy products. It's definitely a learning journey. So please tell us uh, how you say that at the beginning, in the introduction, that it was all about partnership. Who do you partner with and how does it work really? Can you share with us? Yeah, sure. So um, f first of all, um, I think it's important to remember that um, those partnerships are actually the result of a few years of experience in the field because uh, the companies that we operate have been actually operating since some of them 10 years, 15 years, some others 70 years. So we didn't start um, 70, years. 70 years, absolutely. The reconditioning of parts is something in the activity of the automotive industry which has been running for 70 years. The, by reconditioning, by the way, what I mean is taking an old engine, an old gearbox, an old turbo uh, booster, and to make it new by reusing roughly 80% of old materials. Okay. So today, uh, actually three days ago, we launched a, an offering in the electric space, uh, being the first to offer reconditioned parts on the batteries, so the electric batteries of the Zoe's, for example, the Twingo's and so on. Um, the uh, reconditioning of the engine and all those reconditioned parts are roughly 30% cheaper than the new one. Okay. But they are as good as the new ones. And all of that is the result of 70 years of experience of reverse logistics, and uh, backward engineering and making sure that basically the product is new. How do, we, how do we partner? Why partnership is important in that journey? It's important because in the field of automotive, um, the problems to solve are at a significantly large scale. And in order to provide solutions which are competitive, uh, there needs to be a certain level of scale. And how do we achieve scale when you know the engines, the gearboxes, the turbos are located a bit everywhere, you know, in the, in the, in the country or in Europe, uh, it's by partnering with the companies that are helping us to understand how to create the networks, how to be efficient in the collection, how to be efficient in the distribution. And unless we have the right partners, and to, uh, we work extensively, for example, with Suez, uh, cooperating some of the companies that we own, uh, unless we have that, uh, we're not able to uh, provide, you know, competitive products. So to move the needle, you really partner on the field with uh, the people that are recycling, reusing, etc. What about the partner with the automotive industry? Is it about what is, you know, what brings you scale? Is it about partnering with a key automotive brand? Or is it about uh, moving into markets, geographical markets that are more front runners than others? Can you tell us more about it? Sure. Um, uh, I think, I think it's um, a bit of both, um, but really uh, we are targeting any type of problems that the automotive industry in Europe may have, whether they are coming from suppliers, from uh, car makers, or individuals. Uh, you know, individuals like you and me, potentially we own a car and we don't know how to get rid of that car in a way that is respectful of the environment or that is, you know, enabling the network to operate efficiently. We have a solution for that. It's called the goodbye car, but it's, it's something that we, that we have operated. But bringing that to a level which is uh, at scale, uh, which is big enough for the automotive industry requires our company to serve not only Renault Group or Stellantis or Volkswagen, but bo most of those, of those car makers. I'll give you an, a very quick number, an example. Um, we run a company together with Suez uh, called Bunke Menor, uh, which is a company that basically collects uh, the scraps from uh, steel when they are uh, under the production lines of car makers. So whenever you do you know, a, a, a door in a car, there is the space for the window, and unless you have scrap of steel, 
uh, you would have, uh, you know, a door with, uh, you know, a black window. So <laughs> that wouldn't work. So uh, there are companies like Boon Commoner that are able to recollect all that scrap and to put it back on the market so that it comes back in the form of recycled steel uh, in the cars. And today, 85% of a car is recyclable. Up to 30% of recycled materials can be introduced in a car. And our focus, our goal is to make that grow to 35, 40, 45, 50, and so on and so forth. Thank you. And while we were preparing the panel, I remember very well the discussion is that uh, it's all about learning, you know, learning journey. And what is exactly the role that you give to your customers? And how can they help you on this journey? Or how can you help one another? Well, in fact, maybe if, we, if I go back to my example, so again, only 4% of the office desk or the shares are refurbished, mm -hmm. where we could go to 60%. So the question is, why? Because this is so simple. <laughs> it's so common sense that why, why is it the case? Because circular economy has to become an industry. It has to go to the industrial scale. It has to get out of something nice, uh, something good to do, to a real industry. So first, we believe that it is our mission in Manhattan, as a distributor, not to wait for things to change, but to say, let's be the change. So we invest money. Uh, we are creating this circular hub. And we say we are going to partner with our suppliers because we need spare parts, uh, we need to reinvent the supply chains, and we also need to partner with our customers. So what we expect to our customers uh, is to be pioneer. So today we are really talking a lot to our customers, saying we need to learn with you. Because what we offer is different uh, than what you will traditionally see. Again, we, not be, we might not be able, if you want 25 like this, we might have 20, so you might need to accept uh, that you will have five which are new, because we don't have 25. So we need customers to under the, understand that. And we also believe that, if I, if I may say that, we need to make circular economy sexy. In a sense that we need to get out of, this is used so it's cheap, to, well, this is modern, this is smart, this is good for the planet, uh, this is good, socially good, because in our circular hub, we have people in insertion, so people, so we have to, and, and it's nice. And these are nice products. And even it's nice to have different colors. <laughs> so how do you transform constraints into something that become trendy, smart? And this is what we expect for our customers. And we expect to find pioneers. We say, OK, great. I'm going to play the game with you. And I'm going to open this new activity. But we also need our supply, suppliers. Because as you say, it's a revolution of the, of the value chain. And we, our distributor, we are connecting people, we are connecting products with users. And our job is to connect suppliers, customers, also partners that are going to help us to learn how to refurbish, economy social et solidaire, because we want to work with them. So we want to be an integrator of a whole value chain to really recreate an industry. And in the end, that we stop saying, oh, but why 96%? It is so evident. Problem is that uh, it's not because it's evident that it's simple. Mm. For, for sure, it's, it's a complex journey. Uh, maybe, uh, as you say, it's a learning journey with, uh, with your peers, with uh, suppliers, with customers. Maybe you can share, Pierre-Olivier, one thing that you have learned along this way. Um, one thing that we have learned is that, um, again, I think that uh, when, you start, when you start this journey, uh, you can spend hours, uh, make simulation, but it only started when we have opened the hub. So I just you a very simple example. When you buy bike products, obviously the quality of the products will be very important. So you have A product which are really new and we can, you can resell them. You have B product that need a, a little bit of touch up and a little bit of paint. You have C product, you can use the space part and you have D. So you can make a lot of simulation, but until you have opened your hub, you are pur purchasing products and you say, basically I thought I will have 20% A but I, need, I only have 5% A, you need to change the model. So I think you need to start, think big, because we are really doing it on a very professional point of view, but accept that it, won't be, it will be a journey. And it reminds me a little bit when I started in Manhattan 20 years ago, it was internet. Everybody was talking about internet, we need to go internet, but there was no business model. Uh, companies were saying, yeah, I want to buy online, but they had a lot of issues, and we learned. And now, if we hadn't 
done that, we will have disappeared as a business. So our belief, I don't know how much money we're going to make with it. I don't know how percentage of the products it will represent. But what I know is that the next generation will say, oh, we are really grateful you've done that, Manutan. If not, uh, we won't be uh, there developing the business. Very clear. Just go for it, think big, and learn along the way. Maybe one learning from you, and, and uh, having also willing to shift the, the way the industry operates. You're playing a specific role in there. Yeah, um, yeah if, if, if I may, I have two. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, key, the, the key takeaway um, that, that, that comes to mind is, uh, is the following. Um, circular economy, I couldn't agree more with what has been said on stage before. It's very complex. We need to simplify. We need to make it simple. We need to make it simple when we talk about it. We need to make it simple when we explain what we do. We need to make it simple when we explain what we want to achieve. And you know, it's not very uh, easy to grasp a concept that is a, a loop. You know, where does it start? Where does it end? How many people need to work on that? It's super complicated. So uh, simplifying, that's, that's the key takeaway. Uh, the second takeaway is um, everything has to work together. So. There is no circular economy solution, in my experience, that works if it is not a little bit profitable. And why? Because it has to be sustainable on the longer run. And to be sustainable on the longer run, it has to be adopted by some of the companies that we're designing solutions for. Uh, but it cannot be uh, profitable if there is not a key part of you know, uh, operational excellency. It cannot work if there is not the element of material sovereignty uh, in Europe, for example, for our, for our customers. It cannot work if, in terms of um, uh, sustainability and reporting capabilities, everything is not perfectly aligned. And all of those bricks of the wall are equally important to make the solution work. So key message is, yes, it can work. There are solutions. It's extremely complex. We need to simplify. It's our duty to make it simple, to make it clear, to make it crystal clear for our stakeholders. And we need to be able to reconcile, to wrap up some of the key elements of activities, whether it's from an environmental perspective or from a, an economical perspective, all into you know, the uh, activities that we, uh, that we develop. And beyond your own business, but it's also true for this interaction, if you had the chance to move around uh, in your booth, with your uh, people coming to your booth or others, uh, what gives you hope in our collective ability to move towards a circular economy? Um, what gives me hope is that there is no choice. <laughs> now, I'm in the sense that, uh, again, I think that uh, we know all the limits uh, that we are reaching. Uh, we know it's good. So again, it's, uh, it's working. As you say, it's complex, but it's working. So I, I see no other options. And I think that we are in a period like when uh, entrepreneurs, they want to do it, uh, investors, they want to do it. We need the government to understand that they need to create the condition to make it become an industry. And I think we need everyone to understand it is an industry. Circular economy is an industry. It is something professional. It requires a lot of skills. So I think we are in this moment where what makes a success is entrepreneurs, money, and the state. Entrepreneurs are there. Money is there. States need to understand that it's not recycling. It's a little bit different. Uh, and they need to create the condition so that uh, in B2B, it's more interesting to buy um, a refurbished product. So maybe play around with the taxis. Understand that it's a question also of uh, remade, meaning that we have we have, we have um, a hard time to reindustrialize because it's very hard to ask industry to come back, but we have a reindustrialization right now. It's very clear to action. And there are Let's many politicians again. that are joining us at Change Now, so I think your, your point was very clear. Thank you. My hope, uh, what gives me hope, um, the very two basic elements but are, which are at the core of what we do. First is to see how motivated the teams of a company is. That's insane. I mean. Uh, you know, the, the motivation to come to work and to solve some of the biggest problems by putting everything into action uh, and, and seeing 
you know, the fire in, in the eyes, you know, trying to resolve those, uh, those issues in, in, in the eyes of my, uh, of my employees and, and co-workers is absolutely fascinating. So that, I think, is one definitely uh, uh, a main source of hope. Uh, second, it's the innovation. Uh, I don't know how many innovators we may have today in the room, probably hundreds, you know, in, in, you know, in change now. It's innovation at the door, at the corner, everywhere. Um, we see people working and finding solutions which are absolutely necessary. And the innovation fields are tremendous, uh, whether it's in the field of refining, whether it's in the field of new business models, whether it's in the field of organizational setups and so on. And all of that gives us just, you know, the hope that it's possible. Um, and uh, there is so much more to do that we need to have, you know, those two elements in the, in the recipe. So that's definitely uh, And many, what he hopes is that there were not enough chairs today. <laughs> that's a good so one. there are more people than chairs to listen about circular economy that, uh, that give hope. <laughs> Thank you so much to both of you.